In this final module for the class, Module 7, we will be continuing our discussion of the substance-related disorders by focusing on two more of them, nicotine use disorder as well as caffeine use disorder. We will then discuss your final deliverable, the signature assignment, in which you will be selecting a new medication that has been used to treat a particular disorder that was not discussed in the course. So let's get started on this final module. Unit 13 resembles the previous units in which we will first be introduced to the two stimulants, nicotine and caffeine, then discuss their mechanisms of action, and then finally discuss some medications that have been used to treat these substance-related disorders. So what is nicotine? Nicotine is a pharmacologically active alkaloid produced by the tobacco plant. This tobacco plant appears to have been indigenous to the Americas, but has spread throughout the world. The stimulant nicotine is often used and abused with the sedative alcohol. Interestingly, nearly all smokers are addicted to nicotine, as its tolerance is very rapid. The typical cigarette contains between 0.5 to 2.0 milligrams of nicotine, but only a small percentage of this actually reaches the bloodstream, as the rest goes up in side stream smoke is captured by the filters or is destroyed by burning. The inhalation of smoked tobacco produces the highest plasma levels of nicotine, which begins to enter the brain within 5 to 10 seconds of inhalation. Other routes of administration, including IV injections, produce substantially lower peak levels but within 30 to 45 minutes, the blood levels of nicotine are essentially the same for all methods of administration. Other methods could include nicotine spray, nicotine gum, inhalers, as well as nicotine tablets. The metabolic half-life of nicotine is approximately 90 to 120 minutes in adults. In a fetus or newborn exposed to maternal nicotine, however, the half-life can be three to four times longer. Now let's consider the mechanism of nicotine action. Nicotine has significant effects on a variety of behavioral and physiological functions. As a stimulant, nicotine increases heart rate and blood pressure. It also increases arousal, attention, and cognitive functions. It has an effect on decreasing motor reaction time, as well as improving recall memory. Nicotine and other cholinergic drugs have been used to treat the cognitive deficits associated with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Nicotine may also be used to improve symptoms in individuals with ADHD. Nicotine has a high binding affinity for a subtype of a special acetylcholine receptor. This receptor subtype was in fact named the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor because of nicotine's binding affinity to it. Like acetylcholine, nicotine has an agonistic effect 
on the NACH receptors. And the sodium channels quickly open when nicotine binds to these receptors. Postsynaptic neurons depolarize as a result. The sodium channel returns to its closed configuration after nicotine diffuses away from it. Typically, nicotine remains bound to these receptors for only 1 to 2 milliseconds. High doses of nicotine, however, can have prolonged receptor activating effects as high levels of the drug remain in close proximity to the receptor. Tolerance to several of nicotine's physiological and behavioral effects is observed following repeated nicotine administration. In fact, tolerance may need to occur to its aversive effects before nicotine's reinforcing effects may be experienced. So early exposures to nicotine produce dizziness and nausea, which quickly disappear following repeated administration. Smokers would likely cease smoking if tolerance to these effects did not occur quickly. This diagram illustrates what takes place at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Both ACH as well as nicotine bind to the receptor and they have an agonistic effect on it. Once they bind, the sodium channels open and sodium enters the neuron. After this action is performed, nicotine quickly diffuses from these receptors. The neuron will generate an action potential, will fire, and will subsequently depolarize postsynaptic neurons very quickly. The health consequences of using tobacco products are both well known and numerous. They include lung, esophageal, pancreatic, kidney, and oral cancer, pulmonary disease, and heart disease, increased risk of stroke, and numerous complications to pregnancies, just to name the most common ones. Each year, about 60% of current smokers attempt to quit but fewer than 5% of these will be successful. On the bright side, nearly half of all American smokers will eventually quit. And the prevalence of smoking in the United States continues to decline from its all-time high of just over 50% of adults 45 years ago to fewer than 21% today. There are several pharmacological agents that are able to assist those suffering from nicotine use disorder. These treatments include nicotine replacement therapies or NRTs, bupropion, trade name Zyban, and vereniclene, trade name Chantix. We will now look at these in depth. First, let's consider the nicotine replacement therapies, or NRTs. The NRTs include over-the-counter nicotine transdermal patches, nicotine gum, and nicotine lozenges. There are also several prescription nicotine supplements, including nicotine sprays, and nicotine inhalers. These latter methods were designed to deliver nicotine more quickly and in a manner similar to smoking than the transdermal nicotine patches. Because 
All of these products contain doses of nicotine. The cravings associated with tobacco abstinence are blunted. The idea behind NRT is to transfer the delivery of nicotine from tobacco products to a method of administration that can be gradually tapered off and then eventually eliminated. In addition, many of the health hazards associated with tobacco use can be avoided. NRTs typically extend from 12 weeks to six months. But smokers often find that NRT is not always effective. The slower absorption of nicotine from these products is not a substitute for the rapid absorption of nicotine inhalation. Further, smokers find that it is more diffi difficult to regulate nicotine doses with these products than with smoking. NRTs are all more effective than placebos when compared in randomized clinical trials. In some studies, NRTs nearly doubled the success rate of quitting. The atypical antidepressant bupropion, trade name Zyban, has been used to treat nicotine dependence as well. Its mechanism of action is different from the typical antidepressants. Rather than blocking the reuptake of serotonin and or norepinephrine, it preferentially blocks the reuptake of dopamine. Increasing DA activity by reuptake blockade appears to decrease the severity of cravings associated with nicotine abstinence. It also antagonizes nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, unlike other medications. Bupropion has been shown to be as effective as some of the other NRTs, like gums and patches. The typical dose starts out at 150 milligrams per day, but after three days, it is increased to 150 milligrams twice a day for 7 to 12 weeks. Depending on the severity of the addiction, the treatment can continue for up to 6 months. Varenicline, trade name Chantix, is the newest drug approved for smoking cessation. Its typical dose starts out at 0.5 milligrams a day, then 0.5 milligrams twice a day during the first week of treatment, to eventually one milligram two times a day for approximately seven to 12 weeks. It is a partial agonist for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and shows a binding affinity to them. However, it does block nicotine from activating these receptors. Varenicline is as effective as the NRTs and bupropion in reducing nicotinic cravings and maintaining abstinence from smoking. The FDA recently issued an alert suggesting that varenicline may be associated with an increased risk of psychiatric symptoms. These include elevated agitation, depressed mood, thoughts of suicide, and attempts at suicide. The Federal Aviation Administration also announced that varenicline was not approved for pilots and air traffic controllers for these same reasons. Whether varenicline remains approved for treating symptoms of smoking cessation remains to be seen. 
This slide presents the pharmacotherapies that are used to treat nicotine use disorders. We see them ranging from bupropion to the NRTs, such as gums, lozenges, inhalers, sprays, and patches, and then varenicline. Some side effects are noted with each of these drugs, as well as the dosage and duration are presented as well. And even though 7 to 12 weeks is the norm for many of these medications, they may persist longer, up to six months, and maybe even longer than that, depending on the severity of the addiction. You will find this information helpful in answering this unit's discussion questions. Now let's talk about the stimulant caffeine. Caffeine is an alkaloid found in a variety of plants, including coffee shrubs, tea plants, and cocoa plants. It is the most widely used psychoactive drug in the world. While caffeine is primarily consumed in naturally caffeinated beverages, such as coffee and tea, it is added to a number of other beverages, as well as over-the-counter analgesics, including Excedrin and Anison, and alertness-promoting drugs like No-Dose and Viverin. A small amount of caffeine is also available in products containing chocolate. Caffeine is readily absorbed by the stomach and small intestine within 30 to 60 minutes following ingestion. After absorption, it is distributed to all bodily tissues, including the brain. Peak plasma concentrations are reached within two hours, and the half-life of caffeine is approximately three to four hours. In newborns and infants, the half-life of caffeine can be extended to about 80 hours. This can lead to significant blood levels in infants of mothers who drink caffeinated beverages while breastfeeding. This slide shows the amount of caffeine per cup in familiar beverages. The least amount of caffeine is in a cup of decaffeinated coffee, hot chocolate, and green tea. Black tea has more than twice the amount of caffeine than green tea, and brewed coffee has over twice the amount of caffeine in it than black tea or Coca-Cola. Caffeine users are very familiar with many of the drug's physiological effects. These include central nervous stimulation, such as increased alertness and insomnia, increases in heart and respiratory rates, as well as its diuretic effects. Caffeine is also a powerful constrictor of cerebral blood vessels making it a useful remedy for the treatment of some types of headaches, including migraines. For this reason, it is added to several over-the-counter analgesics. Caffeine is also an effective anti-asthmatic drug because it relaxes bronchial muscles, allowing for greater inflow into the lungs. Whether caffeine increases athletic performance remains debatable, but numerous studies using a variety of protocols have found significant improvement in endurance sports associated with strenuous exercise. With respect to the mechanism of caffeine action, caffeine's principal mechanism 
is antagonism of the neuromodulator adenosine. Adenosine is a chemical that promotes sleep and suppresses arousal. It accumulates throughout the day and begins the initiation of sleep at night. Because caffeine is structurally similar to adenosine, it binds to those types of receptors. Now it's important to realize that adenosine acts to inhibit the release of neurotransmitters dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and glutamate. Caffeine, conversely, blocks the adenosine receptors and increases the release of these neurotransmitters. The result is more alertness and wakefulness due to caffeine. Depicted below is the mechanism of caffeine action. In step one, caffeine shows a high binding affinity to the adenosine receptor. In step two, caffeine will bind to that receptor and deactivate it. Step three then shows that adenosine can no longer bind to the receptor. In other words, caffeine has an antagonistic effect on adenosine. Adenosine is therefore inhibited and a corresponding increase in those respective neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and glutamate occur. In this way, caffeine promotes arousal and wakefulness in the organism. Now let's talk about caffeine tolerance and withdrawal. Tolerance to caffeine's sleep disruptive, cardiovascular, respiratory, and motor stimulating effects occurs quickly. Tolerance can be observed after one to two weeks of moderate caffeine consumption, which is roughly equivalent to 400 milligrams of caffeine per day, or three to four cups of coffee. Other caffeine effects, including its effects on cognitive performance and mood, show little evidence of tolerance. Abstinence in regular caffeine users often leads to mild to moderate withdrawal symptoms, which include headache, irritability, depression, drowsiness, and fatigue. These effects can begin within a few hours of abstinence, but typically peak in severity between 24 and 48 hours. Withdrawal symptoms usually disappear within three to four days. Caffeine overdose, referred to as caffeinism, causes anxiety, irritability, muscle tremors, and insomnia, which are often referred to as caffeine jitters. Extreme caffeinism may precipitate mania, disorientation, delusions, and even temporary psychosis. Caffeine overdose may also cause cardiac arrhythmia, high heart rate and blood pressure, as well as gastrointestinal distress. The lethal dose of caffeine is considered to be approximately 100 cups of coffee. Because of this large amount of caffeinated beverage that would need to be consumed for a lethal overdose, this condition is extremely rare. However, it should be noted that caffeine overdose 
can occur with abusers of caffeine tablets. With respect to the pharmacological treatments for caffeine use disorders, there are currently no approved medications to treat these disorders. However, there are two caffeine detoxification methods that have been used on a fairly consistent basis. They are the code turkey and weaning methods. The cold turkey method involves the person not ingesting caffeine at all. It is the fastest way to detox. However, because it involves a complete abstinence from caffeine, it does cause severe withdrawal symptoms, some of which we have already mentioned on the previous slide. The weaning method involves the person gradually decreasing the amount of caffeine that is consumed. It is therefore much safer, and the reductions occur either on a daily basis or every three to four days. The end result is that in a few weeks to a few months, the person will have withdrawn or abstained from caffeine completely. The caffeine weaning method depicted here shows what can take place over a week's duration by reducing caffeine intake on a day-to-day -day basis. On Monday, they are ingesting two cups of coffee and a caffeinated beverage. On Tuesday, they've reduced their caffeine intake by one cup. On Wednesday, they've reduced the remaining cup to half a cup. On Thursday, they have replaced the coffee cup with a green tea. On Friday, they show a reduction in caffeine by replacing the caffeinated beverage with half a cup of coffee. On Saturday, they are only drinking the green tea. And then Sunday, they have reduced their caffeine to where they are not consuming it at all. Obviously, the weaning method is going to be different depending on how much the person is consuming caffeine. In this case, the amount was not much. For a regular drinker of caffeine, four to six cups a day, it might take several weeks of weaning. For those that ingest more than 10 cups of coffee, it may take a few months. The primary goal in the weaning method is to gradually taper off the caffeine until the person abstains from it completely without suffering from any severe withdrawal symptoms as what commonly occurs in the cold turkey method. Now we have arrived at the Unit 13 discussion. Please review all the resources, video, as well as articles on the respective drugs used to treat nicotine use disorders. Then read the following case vignette on Melissa, who has been diagnosed with nicotine addiction. After you have read that case vignette, please answer the following inquiries. First, why do you think the nicotine replacement therapies, or NRTs, were not very effective in treating Melissa's nicotine addiction? Two, why was bupropion administered to Melissa for a one year's duration 
as opposed to the typical 7 to 12 week time frame. Explain your answer fully. 3. Should Melissa be treated for caffeine addiction now that she is smoke free? If so, what methods should be used? And finally, 4. What are your views on using medications to treat nicotine use disorders in potential clients? This discussion exercise will allow you to integrate the knowledge you acquired in this unit on the various medications used to treat nicotine use disorders, as well as apply that knowledge to your future counseling work with clients who present these types of addictions. Good luck in your postings. The final units for this course, Units 14 and 15, will deal with your signature assignment. You will engage in your preparatory work on your signature assignment in Unit 14. This assignment will deal with the application of a therapeutic medication to a particular disorder. You will then submit your signature assignment document in the Module 8 Assignment tab for Unit 15. The details of your signature assignment now follow on the next several slides. In order to demonstrate your integration and application of all of the psychopharmacological material presented in this course, you will compose a research-based document on a selected drug's therapeutic effectiveness with a specific disorder. The document needs to be six to seven pages in length, excluding the title and reference pages. It should also be in the appropriate proper APA format. Your paper should have the following five sections to it. Each section is worth 20 points. The sections are as follows. A description of the drug and the disorder that you have selected. The explanation of the drug's mechanism of action. Research support for the drug's effectiveness via four articles that you have acquired. The development of an original case vignette with the drug. And then finally, recommendation of the next steps that can be used with the drug. We will now look at each of these sections in detail. So for the section description of the drug and disorder, you will be providing information on the pharmacological intervention that has been used to treat a particular disorder. The pharmacological intervention should be a new medication as opposed to an old one. And the disorder should be one that has not been discussed in the course. You should have already gotten approval on your drug and disorder through the instructor. Now, with respect to the description, your description should include whether the drug falls into a general categorization or not, such as an antidepressant, an anticonvulsant, an antineuroleptic, an anxiolytic drug, and so on how long the drug has been utilized to treat the disorder should be mentioned, the complete DSM-5 criteria for that disorder should be given 
if at all possible? And then, what particular symptoms of the disorder are specifically being targeted by the drug? Next, you will be looking at the drug's mechanism of action. You will be explaining how this drug affects the transmission of neurotransmitters at the synaptic level, as well as how rapidly the body responds to the drug. You should indicate whether the drug is an agonist or antagonist of those neurotransmitters, how it changes chemicals in postsynaptic neurons, how the route of administration, for instance, oral, intravenous, intramuscular, affects how quickly the body reacts to the drug, and finally, what physiological effects both positive and negative, are produced by the drug's usage. You will then be considering the research support for your drug's effectiveness. You will assess the therapeutic effectiveness of this pharmacological intervention by reviewing four research articles on that drug that have been published over the past 10 years using the Chicago Schools Library database. These articles can be neuroscientific studies, comparative analyses with other medications, and or meta-analyses. In your assessment, you should include a description of each article's methodological design, as well as a description of each article's findings. Be sure to provide PDFs to your full text articles and cite them in the references. This section should conclude with a summary paragraph where you synthesize all of the research information to date and derive a conclusion on your drug's overall effectiveness in treating the disorder. Based on the research you have obtained, you will next be developing an original case vignette on an individual who is on that given medication to treat his or her disorder. Your vignette should include the following, the relevant demographic information and life history of the client, what dosage of the drug they were initially receiving to relieve their symptoms, if that dosage needed to be changed over time or tapered off, and finally, how the client has benefited or not by being on that particular medication. Please review past modules vignettes when developing yours to make sure it is descriptive and thorough enough in presenting all of the information. In the final section of your signature assignment, you will be arriving at recommendations involving this drug's usage to treat the disorder. Your next steps should include the following. You should note the advantages and disadvantages, including side effects, of using that medication. You should also note whether more research needs to be conducted with the drug, and if so, in what particular areas of study. And ultimately, whether the drug shows promise as a therapeutic agent when combined with client counseling. 
all five of these sections of your signature assignment are equally weighted at 20 points each, with a total of 100 points. Keep these writing tips in mind when completing your signature assignment. Clearly state your main points and subpoints. Use transitions between the main points and subpoints. Use paragraphs between three to five sentences in length and be sure to indent each paragraph. Use strong, simple, direct statements without unnecessary words. Use statements where concepts are presented first, followed by author citations in correct APA style at the end of each statement. Please paraphrase all information. That is, refrain from using direct quotations from sources. You should have no more than one to two simple quotes in your signature assignment. Finally, check for agreement, punctuation, spelling, and grammar errors prior to submitting your document. Your signature assignment should be a Microsoft Word document, should follow the APA Publication Manual's writing style and formatting guidelines with use of the objective third person language, and should include a title page, text pages, and a reference page with your four research articles. So, I wish you well on completing your signature assignment, and I hope you have learned a good deal in this course, especially on pharmacological medications used to treat a variety of disorders in your counseling field. Take care.